so much and I and I loved it so much because there's so many lessons in the story of, of Ka'ab ibn Malik so it be, became almost personal you know you know when you know the story so well or you know a movie so well you feel like you were in the movie so that's how I feel with Ka'ab ibn Malik you know when I hear about what he was going through it's like I almost feel the feelings and the emotions that he went through and this is the story of Ka'ab ibn Malik failing to show up for the Battle of Tabuk. And we're going to do it in three parts, inshallah. So today is the first part, uh, which is them proceeding to battle. Then we're going to have the second part in which um, he is suffering the punishment of silence. And then the third part, inshallah, we're going to talk about redemption. So today is the tough part for Ka'ab Malik. What leads to that punishment of Kaab ibn Malik. So we're going to start with some lessons. This is a story about repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it revolves around four verses from Surah At-Tawbah, which begin with لَقَدْ تَابَ اللَّهُ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ وَالْمُهَادِيِّ وَالْأَنصَارِ Allah says that Allah has surely accepted the repentance, the tawbah, of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the muhajireen, the migrants, wal-ansar. And the helpers. So it's ultimately about redemption and repentance to Allah, but it's also a story about patience. It's a story about perseverance. It shows that Allah tests the commitment of his most righteous servants. And Allah tests whether that person is going to leave that sin or continue in that sin. So if the person leaves the sin, then it's only going to be for his sake. And it also shows that turning back. Uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, returning back to Allah only brings good in a person's life. And whereas shaitan, he whispers to the person, and this is something that all of us have, have experienced, that when we're going through some hardship, um, we have a feeling that perhaps my hardship is because Allah is angry at me. That the obstacles and the challenges and the difficulties are because Allah is not pleased with me, and that itself is indicative that my tawbah was not accepted or that it's not going to be accepted because if it was going to be accepted, everything will be smooth. And so this story is a refutation of that frame of thinking. That, um, that whisper of shaitan, that if I'm facing hardship, then that shows that Allah is not going to accept my repentance. And so hardship is not an indication of Allah's displeasure but rather it's a testing of his servant to determine whether you're going to continue and proceed to repentance and doing right, righteous deeds. Or as soon as you encounter some difficulty, are you gonna run away? And are you going to um, be tempted by the uh, temptations and the whisperings of shaitan? This is also a story, so that's between Ka'ab ibn Malik and Allah. But it's also a story about Ka'ab and people. It's also a story about human nature. It's a story about bad habits and most of all, procrastination. Because the whole reason for the story is because of his procrastination. The essence of the story is that he definitely wanted to go with the Prophet but he kept delaying it and delaying it and procrastinating in the preparation. He didn't have any obstacles. He didn't have any problem with his health. He had enough wealth. He had enough provisions for the journey. In fact, he says that I was in the best state that he had ever been in order to undertake that journey. And so it wasn't because of any of those reasons, but it was pure delay. He was, you know, uh, he was 
you know, giving his attention to other pursuits, other trivial pursuits. And so this is also a lesson about productivity, about how procrastination prevents a person from not only the short-term goals and the minor goal points, posts that we have, but it also prevents us from achieving superior and higher goals. And it prevents you from being productive because you get distracted. And so this is also a lesson for us that Shaytan is going to try and pull you away from everything that leads towards worship. So part of the trickery of Shaytan is to prevent you from that action. But also Shaytan is going to prevent you from feeling that the action is important or that you have to take the preparatory steps. Another lesson is, is that a person should live their life so that they can avoid saying, I wish I had. So that way you don't have to live a life of, I wish I had done so, if only. And we see this in the Quran, So people, after they leave this world, in the afterlife and in the day of judgment, they will be saying, oh Allah, I wish you had just given me a little bit more time. One verse, it says, that I would have given that charity that I wanted to give, that I thought about giving, but that something was holding me back. So there's some good actions that we think about doing, but we don't pull the trigger. We don't actually do it because something procrastinates us. We say, well, I'm going to do it later. One thing that people are famous for delaying is hajj. I mean, I know countless people who, after COVID, they said, I thought I was going to go for hajj in 2020. And they didn't, I mean, how could anyone know that this was going to happen and that hajj would be canceled? Right? And, and, you know, the last hajj was stripped down to the bare minimum. So it was also impossible for anyone to go for the hajj last year. Inshallah, hopefully, we hope and we pray that it's possible this year. But the thing is, you don't know if you're going to be there next year. You don't know if the opportunities, but people took it for granted that, okay, maybe I won't be able to go. But nobody imagined that there wouldn't be hajj. Like, if you ask anyone, and by the way, it's not the first time in history that Hajj has been canceled. I think it's happened four or five times in history. So don't believe what you see on the internet. People will spread photos of like Mina and Arafat. They're like, first time that no one has performed Hajj. And then I'm like, no, that's not right. <laughs> you know? But you know, we spread things because somebody starts it and we just kind of repeat what we hear. But those were mostly for political reasons, right? Because the, the, it, it wasn't safe. To, to have the hajj in those periods. This is something, uh, you know, which, is, which was beyond our imagination. Another lesson is that regret uh, leads to bad company, right? So Kahab, when he's left in Medina, he's walking through the city and he says by his own testimony, he said, I couldn't find anyone in Medina except for the people who were known for their hypocrisy or for those who were weak and whom Allah had excused. So anyone that had a legitimate excuse had already left. The only people left were the hypocrites and the people who are unable to fight. And so they had to stay behind. So for you know, those who are disabled, etc., cetera, um, those who have legitimate excuses. Um, and this also indicates that they understood that striving was a duty on the entire community, that this was something that everybody had to pitch in. It also indicates the need to befriend the righteous, right? And Allah says that in the end of the verses, Ya wakunu right? So inshallah, in the last, in the two weeks from now, we're gonna have a tafsir of that ayah when we get to it, that's at the end. This is in the conclusion, where Allah says, oh, you who believe, be conscious of your Lord, be aware of him, have taqwa, and ku nu Allah, this is a very unusual construction. Because in the Arabic language, we don't have a to be verb, right? There's no to be verb. So if we say Ahmed um, is, um, is an imam, so you say Ahmed imam, there's no is. Right? The, the, you know, there is a word for was, right? But there's no word for it to be. So normally in the Quran, you'll see Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu taqullah, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu aminu. 
So you'll see a verse in which there's a command. But here Allah says, just be. Kulu. So don't you don't have to do anything, you don't have to say anything. Kulu be with the sadiqeen. Be with the truthful ones. So it's a very unusual ayah. And this comes in the same context of the verses about so about Ghazat Tabuk, about the battle of Tabuk, in the same discussion about the three who were left behind, most famously Ka'ab ibn Malik. So this is another lesson, which is that we have to stay in the company of the righteous people. Otherwise, you'll end up like Ka'ab ibn Malik. Because when he looked to his right and to his left, who did he see? He only saw the opposite influences from what he wanted. He was surrounded by bad company, right? And the Prophet وسلم, he taught us in the hadith narrated by Abu Rayla, that hasten to do good deeds before you are overtaken by one of the seven afflictions. So there's seven affl afflictions that the Prophet said, this is a very authentic uh, hadith in eternity that can affect a person. Then giving us a warning, he said, are you waiting for such poverty? that will make you unmindful in devotion. So the Prophet is not talking about regular poverty, okay? Ashab al-Sufa, even the Prophet himself, they were all affected by poverty, right? In fact, there's hadith from the Prophet he loved the company of the poor, and actually the Prophet praises poverty, but this is a different kind of poverty. And sometimes you might read the hadith about poverty, and you might say there's a contradiction. There's in some places it seems like the Prophet is saying that the poor, this is something praiseworthy, and another place it sounds like it's something bad. So this is one subcategory. There's a debilitating kind of poverty in which the person doesn't have their base necessities. The, the things which they need for subsistence, for existence. The Prophet is warning us from that kind of poverty because that shakes a person's ima. You know, not having a lot of luxuries, that's actually good for us. Right? It's better for our iman if we have less. But there is a sweet spot. Once you start, you know, don't have the necessities, like we shouldn't wish to, to struggle to have enough food to live for the day. Because we don't know if that actually happens to us, we might lose our iman. Right? That might be a test that we can't withstand. So the first thing is that kind of debilitating poverty, which prevents you from devotion. Or prosperity, which makes you corrupt. So much wealth and ease that it corrupts you. Or disease that will disable you. Right? Or such senility that it will make you mentally unstable. How many people struggle with Alzheimer's, dementia, other or uh, mental conditions, which can come at any age, that affect a person's level of awareness, to prevent them from enjoying those years. Or sudden death. Or a Dajjal, who is the worst expected absence. So out of all of those things which are missing that are going to arise, a Dajjal is the worst out of all of those events. Or the hour. And the hour will be the most grievous and the most bitter. So these are the seven afflictions that the Prophet told us that we should heed and watch out for. Another lesson is the letter from the king of Hassan. And this is another plot of shaitan, which is that people will come to us in our weakest point, right when we are very susceptible to being tempted. Then in that moment, shaitan makes evil things seem very uh, pleasing. And sin and kufr will appear in a decorated state that every strong person can, can slip into that. So it doesn't come with all of the trimmings of something bad. So the letter from Ghassan, we're going to discuss, inshallah, when he's in the, in the midst of that um, boycott in which no one will talk to him, complete social isolation, he gets a letter from the enemy showing him compassion and mercy. That is a great temptation, right? And this happens to a lot of Muslims in Muslim countries that... Um, or different organizations, different types of missionaries will come to them and say, oh, we will help you out. Your own Muslims didn't do anything for you, right? And that, that causes a crisis of faith. It comes to the person in their weakest point, and even a strong person might slip in that moment. 
Another lesson is imperfect information. When the hypocrites lied to the Prophet he had no choice but to accept from them. They lied. Now the matter was not between the Prophet and that person. So the person came and said, I have this emergency in my family, so I couldn't come. The Prophet has to take it at face value. He's not going to investigate it or, or interrogate the person. Now that person has no excuse before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the Prophet accepts Allah. He takes the bahil, what is apparent, and he embraces it and accepts it. So on the surface, a person who lacks wisdom will say that person averted punishment. In fact, the Prophet even asked for their forgiveness. And it would look like, wow, they got the, 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 the request of the Prophet for their forgiveness. But the reality is that they only delayed their punishment. So they're avoiding punishment, but in fact, they averted it only in this world. And then in the afterlife, they have a much greater punishment, which has been compounded by the fact that they lied to the Prophet And then there were the three people who told the truth. And that's on the other side of the equation. These three told the truth and they got boycotted because of that. So on the surface, it seems like they must be fools. Why didn't they take the easy route that everybody else took? They could have just lied to the Prophet They could have made some kind of superficial excuse, which is you know a flimsy kind of excuse. And the Prophet would have asked forgiveness and maybe Allah would accept that forgiveness. But instead, they insisted on telling the truth to the Prophet. And as a result, their tawbah is enshrined in the verses of the Quran. These three people, I mean, this is very important to understand that you might think, oh, these three people, they disobeyed the Prophet. They messed up, they committed a sin. No. These three have been elevated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be mentioned in the Quran. About the three who were left behind. That is a great honor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how many times we ask Allah for forgiveness? We finish our salah, astaghfirullah, al-azim, right? so many different formulas, right? So we ask Allah for tawbah, or maybe we committed uh, an, a, a, a bigger sin. These are for the for the small things, right? We do istighfar and tawbah for the small things which we are unaware of. The things that we're unaware of, this is not good enough, okay? It's a very important point in tawbah. If you committed an error, then you have to make a specific tawbah for that, all right? With an intention. And once you've made that tawbah, then you believe that Allah has accepted it and you move on. Assuming that Allah has accepted your tawbah, assuming that Allah has forgiven you, but do you really know that for sure? You believe it because you have the best thoughts about Allah. Can you imagine if you had a verse come down saying that And Allah mentions And you mentioned how Allah accepted your tawbah. Imagine how you would feel knowing that your slate has been wiped clean. That's how it works to be Ka'ud and Malik. So on face value, it seems like they were losers, they made a big mistake. But in reality, they averted this greater punishment and they were later forgiven. And you've heard that saying that truth will set you free. And literally, that's what happened in the life of Ka'ud and Malik, that the truth set them free. Another lesson is to avoid thinking the worst of people. When Ka'ab ibn Malik went missing, everybody started to ask where he was. And the worst people think the worst about others. And the best people see the best in others. This is why it's not a hadith. Some people, they repeated it as a hadith that the believer makes 40 excuses. But the meaning is sound, right? And the scholars, they have reported it as a saying of one of the early generation scholars that it appears in Shu'ab al-Iman of al-Bayhaqi, right? That you should make 40 excuses for your brother or for your sister. 
Meaning that if you say, oh, they said that? Maybe they said it because of that. Or maybe they did that because of that. Trying to explore a reason or justification for why somebody would do that. So avoid thinking the worst of people. It also shows the love of the Prophet وسلم, that he noticed who was missing. That's amazing. That in this huge battle of tens of thousands of people, an enemy, the Romans, with hundreds of thousands of people, the Messenger وسلم, when he was in Tabuk, he said, where is Ka'ab? that he is intimately aware of each person's coming and going, and that he notices that person. It's very special that the Prophet ﷺ used to call people by their name, you know? And that's something very special, you know? In, in the time of the Sahaba, if somebody didn't come to the masjid for one fajr or one salah, they would go to the person's house to check on them. Are you sick? Are you doing well? Is there something wrong? What happened? Nowadays, some people pass away and nobody knows about it for days or weeks because no one visits them or no one calls them. Look at the brotherhood that existed in the time of the Prophet and he has the most important mission in all of humanity and he notices where everyone is and what they're up to. Another important lesson is that things do not always seem fair. But Allah is just and he takes all factors into account. Even the things that cannot easily be quantified. Being punished temporarily in this world is far better than receiving eternal punishment in the hereafter. One interesting thing about this hadith is that it's narrated by Abdullah ibn Ka'b ibn Malik. It's very unique. Abdullah is telling us the story that his father told him. How many fathers will tell their son about the lowest point in their life, their greatest regret, their greatest mistake, and expose they will be completely vulnerable and expose to him and to all of history their own imperfections. Most people would hide it. And if they did tell about it, what would they do? They would, they would whitewash it. They would skip over the bad parts. They would say, well, it was because of this. Or let me just tell you about that other aspect. They would not mention their greatest mistake. Or they would present it in the best possible light. But Kahab ibn Manik, he tells his son directly because he wants his son to benefit from his own mistakes. Many of us, we present in front of our children this persona that we have never made any mistakes, that we have always been right because we're hoping that they also don't make the mistakes. But the problem with that is that when they do, when they do make a mistake, which we all will make mistakes, they will be embarrassed to come to you and tell you about it because they have this image about their father, which is not real, right? So they're worried that it will be a source of, of disappointment rather than being a learning opportunity. But when he does give the lesson, he mentions also all of his good qualities and his good contributions. So Ka'ab ibn Malik, he's humble, he's open, but he's also self-aware that I made this huge mistake, but to put it in context, this is not who I am. This is the worst mistake that I have made, but it does not define who I am as a person. And that's actually related to one of the key lessons, that no matter how good you are, no matter how religious you are, no matter how pious you are, the best people on this earth can still fall victim to shaitan and their lowest impulses. There is no saint or wali or sheikh or scholar. There's no authority in this religion. There's no one who is protected from sin. It's only the anbiya. It's only the prophets who are protected from sin. And that was because it had to be that case in order to protect their message, that they had to be ma'asum min al-khabar. 
Ka'ab was a Sahabi who never missed a battle with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Along with Hassan ibn Thabit and Abdullah ibn Rawaha, they are from the Shu'ara ibn Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They are from the three famous poets of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They, this was approved and encouraged by the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They used to praise him and he used to use their poetry in order to uh, praise groups and also to attack opponents. They used to, and, and most importantly, they would use their poetry in order to propagate the message of da'wah, the message of Islam, because that was the media at the time. So it's like, instead of Twitter, they would have Qasida, Qasida Twitter, right? So they would have, you know, without having any, that was the social media. People would hear it, then they would repeat it. And they would say, oh, so-and-so said this, and, and they were very eloquent. And that was the way in which information was disseminated throughout the society. But just because you have this great past doesn't secure you from making a mistake. You can be this illustrious personality, and you can still be prone to making an error. You can have spotless background, you can have good lineage, you can have great education, and you can still slip. So that teaches us that we have to always be vigilant about the a'mal of the present. Don't talk about who you were before. Don't rest on your laurels, as they say. Don't depend on the good actions which you did before. Oh, I made hajj six times. So then you become very complacent. You become very lazy because you feel that you reached a certain maqam. You reach a certain stat stature, a certain level. So you shouldn't be arrogant or proud about your achievements in life. Whatever you have been able to do, that is min fadlillah, min fadli rabbi. This is from the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But your mind, should, your eye should be on the prize, which is the amal of the present, the work of today. And the very last lesson for us to mention before we jump into the story is the humility and the courage of Ka'ab. He is a very pious Sahabi. When you listen to this hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, it truly, I can only speak for myself, it touches the heart. You feel like you can relate to him in a way that you rarely feel when you read other hadith, because the other hadith are, the Prophet said, said, the Prophet said, did. When you read the story of Kahn, you feel like you're in his flesh. Like you're walking his experience and you're living that experience. It's only a very truthful person who can admit their mistakes. It takes a very honest and a very courageous person to admit their own mistakes. People are afraid to talk about their imperfections. And if he did not give us this complete story, no one would have ever known how this instance how this incident affected him. The reason that we know about the whole story is because Ka'b ibn Malik related it to his son and his son shared it with the rest of the world. Otherwise, we would only know the verses from Surah Al-Tawbah. But now we have a 100% complete story from beginning to end. With the, with the, with the events, with the, 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 the statements that were made, and also with the emotions that were behind all of the statements. So Bismillah, we'll start with the story, inshallah. We're only talking about the first part, which is the, the lead up to him being punished by the Prophet The context is that we are now in the period after Fath Mecca, after the conquest of Mecca. So the believers are very strong in Al Jazeera Al Arabiya, in the Arabian Peninsula, they're expanding tribes. Am al Wufud has already happened. The year of delegations in which they would send messengers and they said, we're taking Bayat, we're accepting Islam from east and west and north and south. They're coming from all of Arabia, embracing Islam. Most of Arabia is Muslim. Mecca has also been conquered. And Caesar, this is what we say in the Arabic Qaisa, right? But it's not the Caesar that you're talking about in the Roman literature. Right? But they used to call Qaisar the ruler of Byzantium, who was the greatest military force on earth at the time. The Roman Empire at the time of the Prophet was the greatest superpower. Yes, some people they say Persia was also very strong. Persia was very, very wealthy, but militarily, the Byzantines were the strongest. 
The Romans were the strongest superpower in the world in the time of the Protestant, and the Persians were second. Culturally, economically, yes, there are other aspects, but militarily, in terms of weapons, in terms of having a standing army, which is different from the Persians that had a subscription, conscription army, they would have mercenaries and they would have volunteers. The Romans, no. They had a standing army of professional troops, right? So military, they were light years ahead. They wanted to be proactive and to stop the advances of the Muslims because you would say, well, they're in Arabia. Why are the Romans worried about what the Prophet ﷺ is doing? He's not even knocking on their territory. But they were monitoring the Arabian tribes in Asham. So you have Syria, and south of Syria, you have, you know, in, in Lebanon, and in Syria, in Palestine, in Jordan. So there's a point in which there, Jordan was considered part of Asham, right, at that time, right? You have a lot of Arabian tribes in that area. And so now they're starting to think about independence. They're trying to think about their alliances because even though they're not officially Roman territory, they have an alliance with the Romans. And on the other side, they're bordering with the Muslims. So they're evaluating. They said, well, if the Muslims are coming, maybe we should just join them. And the Romans want to make sure that that doesn't happen. And so what the Roman leaders decided is that we need a preemptive strike. It is an urgent necessity to attack before they become stronger. Because what will happen is the, the Muslims will become too powerful to conquer, and they're going to cause unrest in the adjacent lands. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he, uh, he hears about this, right? So the Byzantines, they're raising this huge army, and it, it has two different aspects. You have the Byzantine troops, and you have the pro-Roman Ghassanid tribes that are trying to launch this decisive battle. They want to have a huge battle where they can take advantage of their superior resources, superior forces, and just destroy all of the Muslims at once. They say, once we have this decisive battle, there isn't going to be anyone left over. This, brothers and sisters, is an existential crisis for the Ummah. It's very possible that a person going to Ghazwat Tabuk is never coming home because they were wildly outnumbered. And these people were professionals with all the resources you can imagine. And they were there on a mission to annihilate Islam and to annihilate Muslims. So this Ghazwa Tabuk is the most important out of all of the battles from a historical perspective. Religious is different. Historically, this is the most important battle in the life of the Prophet from that historical perspective, right? It's a huge undertaking. So this is a very unusual battle. It's the Battle of Badr, they didn't even know when they were in the middle of the battle that they were in the Battle of Badr. They were there because of the caravan. They didn't know that it was happening. It, was, it happened in real time. In Uhud, there was an army that attacked suddenly and they needed to launch a defensive war at that time. The same thing with al Khanda. The Battle of Ahzab. They all the alliances came and they wanted to attack Medina. In Tabuk, it's very unusual because the Prophet had information that they are going to attack well in advance. So they had to make uh, preparations. And rather than waiting for the attack, the Prophet assembled all the troops to meet that army. Look at the boldness of the Prophet. And meanwhile, the people are terrified. People are beyond terrified. They're used to fighting with swords and daggers on camels with each other. These are, they're not, this is not like, you know, a movie scene with professional troops and huge armies and, and weapons. The Sahaba were not equipped to handle this. They were completely, the truth is they were terrified. That doesn't mean that that didn't cause them to hesitate to go. But if you ask, were they afraid? They were afraid. They were afraid about what they were going to face. And the Prophet ﷺ, he delivered, deliberated with the companions. The Prophet ﷺ, as a strong leader, he always discussed what he was doing with his Sahaba, and especially with the most respected people within the community. They don't need to have an official title, right? So similarly, in our 
organizations and our community, when we take an important decision, we do much more of it, right? We discuss it. It doesn't mean that it has to be discussed with each and every single person, but it means that one person should not unilaterally impose their will on all of the others without any discussion. There might be cases in which, as a leader, you have to take a decision which is unpopular. And that is also with, with the mashwara, with the shura, then you will have more confidence that people have a chance to say what they think. And they have to respect it even if they don't agree with it. This is very, a lot of Muslims, they have a problem with this. <laughs> They're like, oh, democracy. Well, I mean, we had a few years in which we had a leader we didn't like, right? But we followed, right? We, you know, we're all still here, life continues. And so there has to be respect for that as well. Inshallah. And he ordered the companions to make preparations for warfare. And what we see is that the Sahaba immediately complied and they rushed to do so. Almost everyone came forward positively. They donated their money, their businesses, their camels, their horses, their weapons, their metal works, whatever they could, they brought it forth. And most importantly, they came physically to volunteer in order to come. It was only the people that had weakness in their heart who stayed behind. And this is one of the greatest uh, fitna tribulations to affect the Sahaba. But Allah mentions in the Quran about this, about this scenario. It appears in Surah Al-Imran. Allah says, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Ma kana Allahu liyadhara al-mu'mineen ala ma antum alayhi hatta yameez al-khabitha min al-tayyib. Allah says, and this is the first part of the ayah, that Allah will not leave the believers in the state in which you are now. So you're, you're murtah, you're relaxed, you're comfortable, everything is great. Ma kan Allahu Allah is not going to leave you safe, secure, and, and relaxed. Hatta until yamiz al khabitha min al That Allah gives us challenges and trials and tribulations and tests. Why? to distinguish the wicked from the good. Because when we are exposed to, to difficulty, then our best qualities come forward. In fact, the word fitna is the word for taking a metal and exposing it to extreme heat. And the impurities have the lowest density, so they rise to the top. So the blacksmith takes the metal, puts it into the furnace, the impurities come, they wipe it off, and then the pure gold is left behind. And the pure metal is left behind because different metals, right? You get to the melting point. And once you reach the melting point of all of those metals, the one with the least density comes to the top. And our life experience is similar. When we're exposed to great difficulty and great hardship, the strong are able to withstand it and the weak, their weaknesses are exposed. And so at that moment, I mentioned the story so you understand the context that to stay behind and to not defend the Prophet and the Ummah and the other believers in that moment, that was tantamount to hypocrisy. In that moment of the greatest moment of crisis, to not be with the Prophet and that existential crisis, it basically equated to hypocrisy. And that's why attendance has never been more important than in Ghazal Tabuk. Whenever the Prophet was informed of somebody left behind, he would say, leave him al alone. If Allah knows him to be good, he will enable him to follow you. But if he were not so, then Allah will relieve us of him. SubhanAllah. See how the Prophet is focused on quality over quantity? If the person is good, they will come on their own. And if the person is bad, Alhamdulillah, they didn't come. I'm paraphr this is not how he said it. But this is the understanding, which is that we don't just need bodies. We need people who are going to add value and to improve it. Similarly, in a community, when you're starting a new initiative, you're starting a new masjid, you're starting a new project, you're doing a charity, they say, oh, only five people came up to, to help. If you have five good people, that's much better than five, having 500 people who start arguing with each other and causing fitna. And then one person is like, oh, put a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. And then, oh, that was good, but why didn't you do it a different way? Right? You know how we start criticizing and critiquing each other instead of actually being focused on getting the work done, even with the imperfections. So everybody who was left behind, either they had a serious excuse 
or they were hypocrites who told blatant, outright lies based on forgery or delusion to the Messenger There were some who were late and didn't ask for permission, but there were three who were left behind who had no excuse. They had no real excuse. And so as we, as we mentioned, we talked about Ka'ab ibn Malik, how he was one of the three poets. He was considered before Islam, one of the five greatest poets in Medina. And he was famous for his aggressive, so they would use uh, poetry for shatm, for lampooning opponents. So it was actually considered like a war device. They would use poetry in order to attack. And as you know, there was war for generations between Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj, right? And so he was part of that. He was well-educated. He was knowledgeable about accounting and reading and writing. And when he learned Quran from people of Dawus, that they became Muslim, then he goes with his friend Bara to, uh, to Medina to see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he gives bayan to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he's pleased because he's a poet, which is another lesson. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we talked about this when we talked about Abbasah. It is a good thing for Muslims to reach out to celebrities and people of influential position. It's not a bad thing. That if you are talking to people who have means and resources and influence, and you try to tell them about Islam, it's not a form of favoritism. These are people who are influencers and movers and shakers within the society. If they become Muslim, so for example, Kufayl, um, he became Muslim. And when he became Muslim, lots of other people became Muslim because his whole tribe followed him. So this is a great example. This also reminds us of our own Tufail and our community brother Tufail Ahmed, who passed away in Karachi um, this week. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him mercy. And you know, he has a beautiful name that reminds us of the companion uh, Tufail, right? And they have a that name has been associated with many people in history who are helpers and who do work and good work uh, for others, especially in charity. So as we mentioned, the story is related by Abdullah bin Ka'b bin Malik, and he became Ka'b's guide when he became blind. And so they have a very close relationship. So here's, the, we're gonna say the, the words from Al-Bukhari from his own lips. He says, I was not absent from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during any campaign that he fought in, except the Battle of Tabuk. Nevertheless, I was absent from the Battle of Badr. However, no individual was admonished for non-participation. Indeed, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam departed in search of a caravan of the Quraysh. Thereafter, certain events took place until Allah assembled the two armies unexpectedly. Verily, I witnessed the night of al aqaba with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the night wherein we pledged our allegiance to Islam. Furthermore, I would not exchange it for the Battle of Badr, regardless of the fact that the Battle of Badr is deemed more noteworthy among people. It shows how highly he regards Bayat al -Aqaba. In relation to my news, so before was just a preface that I'm not a bad guy, but here's the mistake that I made. We talked about that. I had never been, I had never before been stronger nor wealthier than at the time I remained behind the Prophet during that campaign. By Allah, I had never before been in possession of two she camels until the time of the battle. The Messenger of Allah would conceal his intention to embark upon a military expedition by making reference to other campaigns until the time for that expedition arrived. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam conducted that expedition during a season of extreme heat, undertaking a lengthy journey through desert terrain. In addition, the enemy was great in number. Thus the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam clarified the matter to the Muslims in order that they prepare themselves adequately. And he informed them of their intended destination. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was accompanied by a considerable number of Muslims whose names could not be recorded in a book. So as I mentioned, it's, they're different numbers, but let's say hundreds of thousands versus tens of thousands. So tens of thousands of Sahaba is a huge number, it's, but it's not like nowadays. That, that is a huge number of people, especially for desert Arabs. 
Karab continued, any individual who wished to remain absent, absent would assume that his absent would pass unnoticed. It's such a huge crowd. You can't even record all the names in a book unless it was revealed by Allah by means of divine revelation. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, undertook that expedition during a season when the fruit had ripened and the shade had become pleasant. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, and the Muslims equipped themselves with the necessary provisions. I too departed in order to prepare myself. However, I returned without accomplishing anything. So every day he says, I'm going to get ready. He doesn't. I would say to myself, I am able to prepare myself. Don't need to ask anyone. Hence, I continued to postpone my preparation. However, the people occupied themselves in earnest with the journey until the day arrived when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the Muslims proceeded to depart. However, I had not completed any part of my own preparations. I said to myself, I will prepare my, uh, myself in one or two days after his departure. No big deal. And then I will join them. The morning after their departure, I set out to equip myself. However, I returned without completing anything. As you know, when you go into battle, you have to bring enough water, enough food. You have to prepare your weapons. You need to make arrows. Right? All of these things are done by hand. And they take, you know, a few days in order to complete the preparation. He said, the following morning, I set out again. Nevertheless, I returned without accomplishing anything. Every day he says, this is the day I'm going to do it. Nothing ever gets done. This continued until they hastened towards the battle and the campaign had passed by. Now the Ghazwa has already happened. Nevertheless, I intended to depart and reach them. Would that I had done so. So even though the campaign is over, he's like, well, I can, at least I can meet them and catch them. And he said, and he's giving in a footnote, I wish I had done it. However, I was not destined to do that because to join them, he doesn't need to do any preparations because the ghazwa is completed. He just hops on his, on his camel and he goes and he meets them. However, I was not destined to do that. After the departure of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I would enter among the people and it would become a cause of sadness. Every time he saw a person in Medina, it made him depressed. For I did not see except the one suspected of being a hypocrite or the weak and infirm whom Allah had excused from participation. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not remind, did not remember me until he arrived in Tabuk. He was sitting among his people in Tabuk and asked, what happened to Ka'ab? A man from the tribe of Bani Salama responded, O Messenger of Allah, he was hindered by his garments and his pleasure for his clothes and for himself. So somebody from Bani Salama he said, oh, he must have been busy, you know, looking at himself in the mirror, enjoying life. That's why he's not here. Mu'adha bin Jal, obviously the person doesn't know, but he's implying that there's something sinister. Mu'adha bin Jabal said, what a wretched statement you have uttered. See, Mu'adha bin Jabal doesn't know the circumstances, whether it's good or bad, but he immediately defends him. He says, you have uttered a, a terrible statement. O Messenger of Allah, we do not know of him except for goodness. We only know khair about this person. Hence, the Prophet became silent. While he was in that position, he saw a man clothed in a white garment, real in essence. So somebody's coming with a light white clothing. When you hear that, the first thing you think is this is Sarab. This is a desert mirage. But he mentions, no, 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 it's a real person. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, may it be Abu Haytham al-Ansari. Look at the love of the Prophet Sallallahu and his good thoughts about Ka'ab al Malik. He sees a random person coming in the desert with white clothes from a distance. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is praying that that be Ka'ab. He wishes it to be true that Ka'ab is the one who's approaching. He was the one who donated a measure of dates when the Munafiqeen defamed him. And the Prophet is mentioning good qualities about him and how people have attacked him before. Then Karab says, when I learned that he had turned in order to return, I was consumed by distress. I started to invent lines. Right? So it's like, you know, when you're home, your mom comes home and you knocked, you knocked the, you broke the glass vase, right? So you start thinking, okay, which brother did it? You start coming up with excuses. Who stole the cookie from the cookie jar? Right? So he starts coming up with ideas. So he starts concocting lies. 
He said, I started to question myself. <laughs> what can I say to avoid his anger tomorrow? I sought assistance from every individual of sound mind and judgment from among his family. This is another thing. When you guys have trouble and you start asking for advice, be careful. Some people will give you some bad advice. We've experienced this. When it was mentioned that the Prophet's arrival was imminent, the false excuses vanished from my mind. I stopped thinking about coming up with a lie. I recognized that I could not liberate myself from this predicament through falsehood. I therefore resolved to stick with the truth. He said, I'm going with the truth. The Messenger arrived the following morning, and it was a practice of his that upon returning from a journey, he would proceed to the masjid and he would do rakaatin. He would do two units of prayer, and then he would sit among the people. After those matters had taken place, the absentees approached him. So the people started to come, right? They presented their excuse. They would take their oaths. Wallahi, wallahi. You guys know the wallahi people, right? It's like, you swear that much. Like, you really don't think I'm going to believe you. <laughs> I was doing a business person. And I said, bro, I believed you in the beginning. But after all these wallahis, now I'm starting to wonder. <laughs> he started laughing. <laughs> True story. Right? You know, when it started wondering, it's like when somebody says, in my humble opinion, so then all the other stuff wasn't humble. In my honest opinion, so all the other stuff wasn't honest. You know, that's like when somebody keeps insisting, you know, I'm being honest with you. And you know, like, okay, well, if you have to attest to your own honesty, then there's something wrong, right? Rather, but if you are known as an honest person, so your words will speak for themselves. Inshallah. So, you, you know, people, they would take their oaths and they would be over 80 men in number. The Messenger وسلم, he accepted their excuses, their oaths, and he asked forgiveness on their behalf. In addition, he entrusted unto Allah their secret affairs, meaning he didn't expose them unethically. The Prophet knows who the hypocrites are, but he didn't expose anyone. Then he approaches him, Ka'ab, and he conveys salam. The Prophet وسلم, is described by Ka'ab that he smiled back but it was a smile of one who was enraged. So even in anger, you know there's a certain smile where you're smiling, but you're really pissed off. So he got that smile from the Prophet which also shows a lot about the sunnah and the, the, the character of the Prophet that he indicated his displeasure, but also he didn't disparage him, he didn't embarrass him. He said, come forward. I approached him walking until I was sitting before him. He said, what prevented you from accompanying us? Had you not purchased a riding animal? This is like an opening. The Prophet said, oh, was it because you didn't have a ride? And he said, I responded, of course, O Messenger of Allah. However, by Allah, if I was in the presence of any other man from among the inhabitants of the world, if there was anybody else in the universe but you, I would avoid his wrath by presenting an excuse for I, he said, as a poet, Kahab ibn Mal, one of the five most famous poets of Medina, one of the top poets in all of Arabia, I have been given the ability to speak in an eloquent and persuasive manner. Out of all the people who can give the best excuse, Kahab. However, I am aware that if I utter a lie today in order to seek your pleasure, certainly Allah will cause you to be enraged with me in the future. Alternatively, if I inform you of the truth, thereby causing you to be angry, I may nevertheless hope for Allah's pardon. So that's what he's hoping for. The real goal is the pardon from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then what does Kalim say? He says, no. By Allah, I do not have an excuse to present to you. I have no excuse. I had never been stronger nor wealthier than during the time that I neglected to accompany you. The Prophet ﷺ said in relation to this man, he has spoken the truth. Therefore, stand until Allah pronounces judgment in, his, in this matter. I therefore stood a group of men from the tribe of Bani Salama became disorderly and started following me. They addressed me and say, By Allah, we have not known you to commit any misdeed. 
Verily, you committed a grave error in excusing yourself before the Prophet when all the other absentees, they presented similar excuses. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, seeking forgiveness for your misdeed would have been sufficient for you. Just make any excuse so he asked for forgiveness. And they continued to reprimand me and reprimand me until I started to desire to come back to the Prophet وسلم, and to fabricate a lie against myself, meaning contradict myself, right? To change my testimony. However, I questioned themselves, is there anybody else in a similar position? They said, yes. There are two men who uttered the same statement as you, and they both received the same directive. That just wait, and Allah is going to pronounce judgment on you. And they are Murara ibn al Rabia and Hilal ibn Umayyah al Waqifi. And by their statement, they had referenced two virtuous men who were part, who were Badri. They participated in the Battle of Badr and were examples to be followed. And after the two of these men were mentioned, <coughs> I remain steadfast. I said, I'm going to I have good company, so I'm going to stick with the truth. Thereafter, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa prohibited the Muslims from speaking to me. No one spoke to the three of them at all. They didn't do business with them. They didn't greet them. They didn't talk to them. They ignored them completely. And he says, namely, the three individuals from among us who had neglected to accompany him. And this is the point in which the poet is punished with silence. This is the lead up to the story, inshallah. And we talked about the lessons in the beginning, and inshallah, the questions, we can discuss it some more. Um, next uh, Friday, inshallah, we'll continue with the second portion. And that second portion, if you want to read the verses in Surah at tawbah it's ayahs number 117 until ayah 120. So these are the verses that we're doing the tafsir of. But most of the tafsir is one hadith in Bukhari. It's so important of a hadith that Imam al-Bukhari, he made its own chapter, which is the, the bab, the chapter of the repentance of Kaab al -Mani. So I promise you, you're not going to have any problem finding the hadith if you look for it. And most of our tafsir is surrounding one hadith, which is a very, very important hadith for us to be aware of. So inshallah, we'll uh, open up some questions, some discussion on any of the points that we brought up, inshallah. I'm not getting the, let me see if I can get the, I'm gonna, my link is not working, but I'll figure it out, inshallah. In the meanwhile, are there any questions uh, from here? Okay, yes, from Zoom, I'm, I'm, I'm connected now. So if there are any questions from Zoom, please go ahead and ask your question as well. Today was a, a, a little bit of a different kind of tafsir because it's it's more of a story and more of a history in the life of the Prophet And believe me, when you know all of the history and the details and the background, then when we discuss the ayahs, it will take on a complete different meaning. Then you'll really have a connection uh, about how people felt and how they thought at the time that these verses came down. So this is very, very important because there is, uh, there's a context, right? There's a text and there's a context, right? So there's the verse, there's the nas, and then there's, there's the, the context, the circumstances that were existing at the time that the verses came down. And we can't imagine how big of a deal and how important these verses were coming down. And it, it not only for the three people whose Tawbah was accepted, but for all of the believers, because nobody could imagine somebody as good as Kaab ibn Malik making such a huge mistake, such a huge error. And it affirmed to everybody that, you know what, no matter how big of a mistake you make, the door of Tawbah is always open. It's always possible. Yes, do we have a question? Sorry, in the earlier of this chapter, you told that uh, everybody in Makkah Madina and the surroundings of Makkah Madina ladies and Muslims. Yes. So, but at the time of our Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, mm -hmm. there were Jews in uh, Madina. Yes. And even now, Hadith Khadija Rajah Rakala Anhu took our Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, took his 
My question is, uh, though they were giving in the, all the rights of the Muslims in exchange of the political loyalty, that means Jadiyah, yes. what, what happened to those who are uh, the Jews? Okay. Okay, so this is a question about the, for those on Zoom, uh, Sister Luda's question is regarding the Jewish tribes that existed in Medina um, at the life of the Prophet So there were Jews in Medina and there were Jews also in Khaiba. And there are Christians that are in the Northern regions and there are Christians who are in the Southern regions in Yemen. Okay, so the, the Christians in the southern regions of Najran and so on, most of them became Muslim. The Christians in the northern regions, they mostly continued to be Christian. And actually they were Christian for hundreds and hundreds of years. And actually a lot of them only in Palestine, there's still a lot of people, families who never became Muslim. But the majority of them did become Muslim and actually many, many years after the Prophet it happened very gradually. But with regard to the Jewish tribes that are in Medina, there were three. There were Banu Nadir, uh, Bani Quraima, and Banu Qaynuqa, right? And so there were three different tribes and the predicament, and when the Prophet entered into Medina, there was a constitution of Medina. The constitution of Medina between these three tribes and the Aws and the Khazraj were the main two big tribes in Medina from the Mushrikeen, from the polytheists, was that even though the Prophet was responsible and was in charge of Medina, was that everyone would be on an equal footing. It would be a multi-religious society in which the legal rights and responsibilities of everyone would be the same. At that time, there was no jizya. The jizya came later for once the, the Islamic lands expanded. So actually for the Jews who lived in Medina, they did not have any responsibility to jizya, but they voluntarily accepted the leadership of the Prophet And also from the side of the Muslims, they did not impose an Islamic order. However, the one thing that they had to do was they had to defend the Prophet and Medina, actually not to him personally, but they had to, they had to be loyal, political loyalty exactly, and they had to defend Medina if it was attacked. And in the Battle of Al-Khandaq and Al-Ahzab, two of the tribes actually worked against, well, Bani Quraid is the first one that went against, but then later the other two, they went against the Prophet in an act of political treachery in violation of that treaty, in violation of that agreement. And so with the three tribes, um, some of them were exiled and they went to Khaybar. And later on, you have the Battle of Khaybar, which is not related to them being exiled. And then there were others who were punished because their act of treachery was directly to attack the Muslims. And those who politically attacked the Prophet وسلم, and, and this act of political treason, so they were also, they were punished accordingly, based on a case-by-case -case analysis. So there are some Orientalists, there are some uh, modern scholars, they said that these people were punished because they were Jewish, and this is not true. And we know that because when the Muslims expanded, even in the time of the Sahaba, they entered into Palestine, they entered into Northern uh, Arabia, they entered into Southern uh, Syria, into Asham, actually all, almost all of Asham. And during that period, in fact, Jews were allowed to return back to Jerusalem under the Muslim leadership because they had been exiled by the Byzantines. So Jewish people were not allowed to practice their religion under the Christians. It was only until Muslims that they were allowed to enter to Jerusalem and a Jewish quarter within Jerusalem was established and the temple area was established and the area surrounding Aqsa Masjid was used as a dumping ground. And Umar physically and with the assistance of the Jews and the Muslims together, they cleaned the area of Masjid al-Aqsa from being a, a horse stable and being a dumping ground and they cleaned it up and they built their uh, Masjid al-Aqsa so the Jews were able to worship 
and the Muslims were able to worship. But the condition, but in the case of Medina, because of that political treason, they went from being full citizens with full rights to uh, being uh, you know, guilty of treason. And the last thing that I'll mention about this is when one of the tribes violated the treaty, the Prophet did not punish the other two. So he did not treat all of them the same. It was on a case by case based on what they what, what wrong they committed, right? Because in, in that society, that was something which was very unusual. They used to say, oh, the Jews, you know, nowadays some Muslims say, oh, the Jews did this, the Jews did that. And so they put everybody within one bucket. And this was not the example of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was fair to all people. Yes, that's it. Yeah, so the, for those on Zoom, so the example of um, the Ottomans is mentioned. Um, actually, with the Ottomans, they even gave, not, some people say that the Ottomans preferred non-Muslims over Muslims, which is politically, which is true. The Ottomans established a millet system in which Jews and Christians had their own courts they had their own hospitals, they had their own mosques. So they had their own administrative system within the Islamic state. And so actually for, uh, especially for Jews living in the Muslim lands under the Ottomans or living in Al Andalus in Spain was, uh, I mean, they, they enjoyed full freedom and full opportunity and they were actually able to administer their own uh, affairs, which was preferable to anywhere else in the world. Sister Shanaz is asking a question. We are in this era where the Nabi makes decisions that are very painful for him as a human being, as his heart inclined to other choices. This is uh, very, very uh, true. Uh, and the example in the parentheses Hind, death of Ibrahim, and Wahshi, the woman who committed adultery and wanted her punishment. Is there a compilation of these very human? circumstances that he وسلم, went through. So one book that I would uh, suggest for a student of Sirah is like a kind of commentary. So one of our teachers, uh, uh, actually Dr. Tariq has mentioned him the last time that he was visiting and gave the khutbah and he's one of, uh, I didn't study with him directly, but I used to attend his classes in Damascus. Uh, Sheikh, uh, Sa'id Ramadan al Bukhli, who is one of the top 10 scholars in the world. And he has a beautiful book called Fiqh Sira, which is the analysis of the Sira itself. And so he asks a lot of questions as to why the Prophet took different decisions and what the circumstances were and what were the reasons and how was he feeling and what was he thinking and what was the discussion. And so I would. Uh, recommend everyone to consider reading Fiqh Sira. Now, and it has been translated into English. I'm not sure what the English title is, but if you look, if you search Al Bouti, B O U T I, and the Sira, I think with the internet, you should, Sheikh Google is going to help you out, inshallah. That's a good resource. And I know that Dr. Farak also has recommended that book in the past as well, so he would probably agree. Yes? Could you talk a little bit about what happened at the book? What happened at Tabuk? This is a great question. Um, that needs so much time. So I didn't realize, um, why don't we do that next uh, Friday, inshallah? Our main focus is, is on the, the tafsir, and, and, um, but we can do that. We can, we can have a discussion, uh, give a little bit of reference as to what happened in Tabuk. But, but so much happened that it needs like at least an hour or two to go into a lot of detail because the battle of Tabuk itself is very complicated and the preparations is very complicated. So if it's okay, I'll skip that. Yes, or we can do it after the, after we complete the story of God. Yeah. yeah, if I remember in late 90s, I was in a inter-religious various intellectual discussion. Some person mentioned about the Giving the Jews because some scholar, so called PhD scholar, not only scholar, PhD scholar, with the name that they were killed because they are Jews. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And I stood up and said, punishment if someone do treason today in the United States of America mm. or in Israel or anywhere on the planet. Mm. Capital punishment has been abolished, but not for the treason. Mm. I asked the answer that it was because of the Jew or because of the treason. Mm. And everybody shut up. <laughs> and the scholar, he looked left and right. I didn't thought about it. And about our history, so, so Khair, I don't know how you speak of my mind at the very beginning. We are proud mm -hmm. and Allah's biggest blessings. Mm -hmm. We do not follow anything somebody said. Our being is protected, guaranteed, preserved, well documented. Mm -hmm. Where the best verse in the Bible, can you go back and trace it back to Israel Islam? Guaranteed. Mm -hmm. And oh, our weakest hadith can be proven, even still, we can go back why it is weak, why it is strong. We have the chain here. Yeah. So this this is very important. The, what I'll add to the to that uh, comment is it's important for us to know our history, because when Islam is attacked, people say that Islam favors men over women, that Islam promotes violence. People say many lies, especially lies about the messengers of Allah. So if we don't know our history then we will be susceptible. We might, young people might start to believe that. They might consider that, yes, this is true. Uh, so it's very important for us to stay educated. Um, another question, what was the name that you suggested we look up in response to Sir Shiraz's question? The name of the book, I assume? I received a message asking for a name, I think name of the book. So in Arabic, it's called Fiqh Sira, which is the, the understanding or the background behind the Sira. Right, uh, but since I don't know how they translated it, so you can search by the author, which is Saeed Ramadan, Ramadan like the month, Al Buti, B O U T I. If you're interested in the book, it's published by Darul Fikr. So I know the publisher, it's Darul Fikr from Beirut, Lebanon, and they publish it in Arabic and in English. And in most likely, you probably will be able to find the text for free online uh, because it's, it's a well known book. So. So I think with that, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he increases us in knowledge. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he allows us to make tawbah. Allahumma inna nas'aluka imanan kamila wa yaqeenan sadiqa wa qalban khashi'a wa lisanan dhakira wa lisanan shaqira wa rizqan wasi'an halalan tayyiba wa tawbatan nusuhan qabla al-mawt wa maghfiratan wa rahmatan ba'd al-mawt والفوز بالجنة والنجاة من النار آمين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين